Welcome to today's virtual media conference to apprise you of government's efforts to combat COVID-19. Today with me are the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, and the Minister of National Security, the Honorable Stuart Young. The Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, will provide an update on COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Good morning to members of the media. Thank you very much for the wonderful work you have been doing. Uh, good morning to Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning to my colleague, the Minister of National Security. There have been a lot of significant developments on the health front over the past 24 hours. So I will dive straight into my report and forego the global picture for today. So let's start. Total number of tests submitted, 1,425. Out of that, you would recall we started our surveillance testing last week, Tuesday, at selected health centers. 63 of those tests under the surveillance program were tested, and all have come back negative thus far. So 63 surveillance tests done from Tuesday, all negative thus far. Total number of unique patient tests, 1,195. Total number of repeated tests, 230. Total number of positive cases, 115. So we had one additional case in the past uh, five days or so. Total number of discharges, 37, including nine new discharges uh, last evening. So discharges, 37. Total number of deaths, uh, sadly, eight, seven in Trinidad, one in Tobago. Total number of hospitalized patients at both Cora and Coover, 32. In Cora, we currently have nine out of 100 beds. So basically, 9% of that facility is being used, and they are all stable. In Coover, we have 200, ah, sorry, 23 people uh, out of 230 beds, so 10% utilization. There are currently no patients in the ICU, no patients in HDU, no patients vented. Of the 23, all 23 are on the first floor, and they are all walking around, what the medical people call ambulatory, mild symptoms. At the Sangre Grande Brooklyn Center, you have 16 patients, and in that 16 patients, it must be uh, reminded all the time that our staff are actually living with these patients under the same conditions of that the patients are there. And I want to congratulate staff who leave their homes and volunteer to live with these patients for the time of their isolation. At the home of football in Coover, we have 22 asymptomatic, that is, no fevers, no coughing, no symptoms, low risk, stable patients. In that facility, we have 14 members of staff, again, who have volunteered to leave the comforts of their homes and live with these patients and nurse them back to proper health. And again, I want to say a special thank you to those uh, persons. On the Tobago front, um, all is quiet. I got a message from the Secretary of Health, uh, Wellness and Family Services. <coughs> Nothing significant to report out of Tobago. In the Princess Elizabeth Center, we have one person, uh, a suspect case, stable, and we are looking at that person. The total number of persons housed and being cared for across the range of our parallel healthcare system, starting from uh, Cora suspected, Princess Elizabeth suspected, uh, Coover confirmed tertiary care, convalescence. We have 109 persons throughout that parallel healthcare system so that it doesn't impact adversely and significantly 
on the operations of the regular healthcare system. That needs to be noted. Of the, um, of the facilities, of the 12 facilities that we have earmarked for the parallel healthcare system, at this point in time, we are using uh, six of them. So basically, we are using about 50% in terms of the numbers of the um, parallel healthcare facilities that we have built, built out. Augustus Long, not in use as yet. Arima, not as in use as, as yet. DBU Campus, not as use, in use as yet. Napa, not in use as yet. Balandra, we can only start to reuse Balandra by this weekend. That is two weeks after the last person would have left Balandra. So those, that is the clinical update. What is really a significant development are the 63 surveillance tests that we have done from last week, Tuesday to now, all negative. At this point in time, I would like to just um, alert the national community to some international developments, which I think should guide the population as to how we conduct ourselves from now until April 30th and hopefully beyond. In scanning the international media, I want to bring you the story of a patient called Leah Blomberg, B-L-O-M-B-E-R-G. Headline goes like this. She spent nine days in a coma and relearned how to walk what this COVID-19 person wants people to know. And I will just read one part of the article. She says, I basically had to learn how to walk again due to muscle atrophy from being 100% bedridden for two weeks. I am lucky to be alive. And she continues, stay in your house. That is a message from someone who has to relearn to walk. Stay in your house. Another headline goes like this. CDC chief says there could be a second, possibly worse coronavirus outbreak this winter. We keep talking about the second wave, the third wave. We are not immune from a second wave or a third wave. And the CDC is predicting that the second wave in the United States could be worse than the first wave. Third headline I would like to share. Singapore toughens coronavirus curbs as cases rebound. Members of the media and the national community, Singapore was lauded as one of the uh, countries that we look to as a gold standard for treating of COVID. They now have to revisit, re-toughen measures which they relax as coronavirus cases rebound. This is a lesson for us in Trinidad and Tobago to learn. The last international headline, well, second to last, coronavirus lockdown. Lessons from Hokkaido's second wave of infection. This is from Japan. I will just quote a paragraph. It was once seen as something of a success story, a region that worked to contain, trace, and isolate the virus leading to a huge drop in numbers. Sounds like Trinidad and Tobago. But Hokkaido is in the spotlight again as it struggles to deal with a second wave of infections. The point that I think we should get in Trinidad and Tobago, and we have been saying this, don't misinterpret the data that we have in Trinidad and Tobago. <coughs> don't rejoice, but be vigilant. The second to last headline I would like to share, and this comes out from Dr. Uh, Joan Paul's presentation yesterday about COVID and children. You remember Dr. Joan Paul said that young children uh, do not suffer uh, the severe consequences and symptoms of COVID, but that you must pay attention to your children who have uh, special conditions like asthma, cancer, leukemia, and all of that. I am going to show, share with you a human interest story about one child and possibly COVID. The name Charlotte Figgy 
is one that should be known, especially for those who follow the debate on medical marijuana. She was a little girl who used to have 300 seizures a day. And out of her experience with medical marijuana, and Dr. Sanjay Gupta following her and changing his mind, this little girl was a poster child for medical marijuana. This little child passed away yesterday at age 13. Charlotte had recently been hospitalized due to pneumonia, breathing problems, and seizures. She was treated as a likely case of COVID-19. Her mother, Paige Figgy, said Wednesday, sorry, this is last week, although she tested negative for the virus. The takeaway point from this, and we've been hearing all along about false negatives, and we have resisted the temptation of Trinidad and Tobago to only accredit private labs who we can take the results to the bank. You would have heard the chief medical officer say on more than one occasion that too many results from private labs come back with false negatives. This is a clear indication of what a false negative can do. Little Charlotte Figgy, age 13, who was a global medical superstar, apparently died from symptoms related to COVID. And this is what Dr. Joan Paul was talking about yesterday. If you have a child, if you have a child with special needs, who has chronic disease like asthma, cancer, you need to treat that child differently. While Charlotte Figgy and his eight persons in Trinidad rest in peace, rest in peace, we must learn from their experience. So as we start to approach April 30th, the chief medical officer, as he has said, will be informing the government as to how we have conducted ourselves under these measures. I would like the chief medical officer to give us a passing grade in all subjects. We would have failed in one or two subjects like COVID parties, we would have failed. But it is not too late to make up and do the right thing so that when the chief medical officer informs the political directorate to make the political decisions, we could come out with a B plus. I would like that for Trinidad and Tobago. We have time to take some extra lessons, some penmanship, so we get a good report card. In closing, I want to address one issue on mental health. We would have said that the population in St. Anne's was decreased from 1,000 to about 750. And we said clearly that was done as part of our mental health decentralization policy. That comment is being misinterpreted to mean we sent 250 people home because of COVID. That is not correct. This government signed off on a decentralizing policy since last year. And even before that, the process of decanting low-risk persons from St. Anne's began. It was a gradual process that may have accelerated a little bit this year because of COVID. So I just want to correct the impression in the public domain. 250 people were not sent home from St. Anne's because of COVID. It was part of the government's decentralization policy, which started under this administration. So I hope that brings some clarity to the issue. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for listening to me for the past few minutes, and I hand you back over to Minister Cox. Thank you very much, Minister. The Minister of National Security, the Honorable Stuart Young, will speak on the government's measures to protect the population and the preparation of various accommodations being used as part of the response to COVID-19. Minister Young. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Good morning, Minister Dial Singh, Minister Cox, my cabinet colleagues, wider viewing and listening public of Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning. I am here this morning to just address a few issues, but important issues nevertheless. I would like to start off by just reminding us of from where we came. We are and continue to be in very unusual 
and difficult times. We are facing the global pandemic that is COVID-19. All, all of the measures taken by the government of Trinidad and Tobago to date, every single one of them has been done to protect us, the population of Trinidad and Tobago. And importantly as well, every single measure was done after taking advice and after consulting and considering very carefully that advice from medical experts. So all of our measures are guided by the medical expert advice and are taken to protect us, the population in Trin of Trinidad and Tobago, in Trinidad and Tobago. There will be inconvenience. At times, there will be pain for all of us. No one is immune from the effects of COVID-19. The government has not made any of our decisions or implemented any of the measures that we all now live with in this state of COVID-19 based on any individual or any group of individuals. It is not an easy task. It is not an easy task. I'd like to start, first of all, by dealing with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and some of the measures that they have been doing. And I start unreservedly by thanking the Commissioner of Police and every single one of the men and women in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service who on a daily basis, including nights, are putting themselves on the front lines to protect us, the population of Trinidad and Tobago. At the outset, the government made it very clear from the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago that we would be not looking to legislate our way out of COVID-19. The Prime Minister and the government through the Minister of Health, the Chief Medical Officer, and my other fellow cabinet members who have addressed you over time have all used moral suasion to persuade you, the population, to do what is right for your brothers and sisters at this time and to abide by the measures, abide by the moral suasion. Because the medical evidence is clear and you can see it happening globally. This virus is spread by contact and it is a very dangerous virus that can prey on some of the weaker in our society. So the measures were done to implement and to slow down the spread of the virus or steer to home regulations. The police service, we've been meeting on a daily basis. And it's, it's funny, in our last three daily outings over the last 72 hours before today, we were talking about what would be the challenges coming ahead. The roadblocks that were implemented across country last week, Friday, were necessary. And I'd just like to remind the public, these roadblocks are not based on the stay at home measures and the regulations and provisions. Crime and criminality continues to affect Trinidad and Tobago. The police have the power to have roadblocks at any hour, any time, based on either intelligence or evidence or just for them to be able to check on our licenses or, or insurance, but also on other occasions when we're looking for something, the police are looking for something in particular. So roadblocks are not a COVID measure. The police are also entitled in law to ask any one of us on the grounds of any reasonable suspicion whether what we are, what we are going about our business to do. And we just respond to them. I'm going to the grocery, I'm going to the pharmacy, I'm going to work, etc. And that is all outside of COVID. And three days ago, in meeting with the commissioner of police and his one of his deputy commissioners of police and our intelligence services and the defense force, we predicted that it would be only a matter of time before someone sought to throw some mischief amongst this. So I'd like to start by saying the commissioner of police has briefed as of yesterday morning the police service at his Comstat, his weekly Comstat, that these measures that the police are implementing and understand there's a trickle down. It's over 7,000 police officers on duty throughout Trinidad and Tobago, not at the same time, but at various times. Police officers conducting roadblocks, etc., do so within the ambit of the law. No one is seeking to use the stay at home regulations. So to try and draw distraction and mischief on that basis, I'm going to deliver food or I'm going to pick up food for my girlfriend is an unnecessary distraction and not one that the police service will be distracted by. So I congratulate and I thank the men and women of the police service for continuing to do what it is they are doing 
on a daily basis to try and keep us, the population of Trinidad and Tobago, safe. Continue. You have the support of the civic-minded and right-minded citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I'd also like to say that what the Commissioner of Police in his briefing this morning has now instructed is the use of the body cams at some of these roadblocks. So we, the population, will see what is the truth and what is really happening and what we can then judge our brothers and sisters on. Loopholes. Unfortunately, as I was just discussing with my two colleagues, over the last few days, we're seeing more and more people attempt to find loopholes in the regulations. And what do I mean by that? Persons buying maybe 10 loaves of bread, putting it in their storefront and claiming to be a bakery. Persons all of a sudden selling mops and brooms and some disinfectant and seeing that they are grocery store. These attempts to circumvent the regulations and the measures that are designed to protect us, the population, really just make everyone's life that much more difficult. But we will continue to do what needs to be done. The Commissioner of Police continues to be in constant contact with me throughout the course of the day. A two-way street, sometimes I get things that I then pass on to him. We discuss it with regards to interpretations. We may not always get it 100% right. But again, I can assure the population of Trinidad and Tobago, every single decision being made is to try and protect you, the population, from the spread of this potentially deadly disease virus called COVID-19. Border control. Well, border control has been a topic for the last couple of weeks. Again, I'd like to speak very briefly on border control. This was done, this is the closing of our borders to non-nationals and to nationals progressively. It didn't happen overnight, but it took place progressively. I've already gone through on my last two occasions here the history of when in 30th of January the Minister of Health came to Cabinet based on the advice he got from his medical experts, let us implement some regulations, not in the legal sense of the word, but res travel restrictions for persons coming from China. And step by step, we took measures over time as to adding other countries if you've been there over 14 days. Until around the 16th of March, we took a specific decision to say from the 17th of March, midnight, we would no longer allow non-nationals. Every one of these decisions was based on the medical expert advice that we received. I'd also use this point on the 12th of March at a post-cabinet press conference. We did, I think it was the Minister of Health and myself, we mm -hmm. did tell the population that we had taken a decision at cabinet for all non-essential travel of public servants we weren't permitting it anymore. That was on the 12th of March. And on that, on, on that occasion, we also told you, the population, please only travel if it is absolutely necessary, essential, or an emergency situation on the 12th of March. Our borders were eventually closed on the 23rd of March, midnight of the 22nd of March, to all. This was not an easy decision. It was not a decision that we wanted to take. But again, it was a very carefully um, thought through measure based on the medical advice and I dare say it has worked to protect Trinidad and Tobago so our decision to close the borders is done to protect those in Trinidad and Tobago I just want to remind the population importation of this, this virus is what we're combating that's one of the things we're combating you all would recall as we've gone through the history over the last two weeks starting on the 12th of March how this virus came to be imported in Trinidad and Tobago. So the closure of our borders is a very understandable measure to try and stop that importation. Any breaking of our borders at this stage has the potential to start importing the virus back into our environment. And the importation of this virus will not only put our frontline health workers at risk, but it stands the potential to put all of us in the population of Trinidad and Tobago at risk. So just understand that simple principle. Re-importation of this virus into our environment, that is Trinidad and Tobago, will affect all of the population once again. It's not necessary to point to the over 50 cases that came from one importation. Our medical experts have advised that this measure is a necessary measure and we will continue to keep our borders closed. Second waves, persons who are observing what is going on, as we in the government are around the world, will note that anyone 
who started to relax their border control mm -hmm. and allow persons to free flow or even restricted flow across the borders to certain categories, for example, their nationals, immediately began to experience a second wave that can be worse than the first wave of infection from COVID-19. The Minister of Health referred to a couple of a few moments ago, Singapore, one of the points of everyone looking at a few weeks ago, started to, started to ease on their restrictions with their border control, immediately a second wave hit them. Japan, states of emergency across their, their country, unfortunately, again because the easing of restrictions. South Korea and their number of other jurisdictions. Bearing all of that in mind, after consulting with our medical experts, we have no intention at this stage to allow our borders to become porous and allow persons a free flow of access. This is being done to protect us, the population, who are here. I remind you, as the Prime Minister has told us and as we've repeated in these forums, there are over 330,000 nationals of Trinidad and Tobago who are outside of Trinidad and Tobago. Just imagine if we even allow an importation of 100 or 200 persons to run the risk of bringing a second wave of the virus into Trinidad and Tobago. That is something we are very clear at the government level we cannot allow to happen. And we're doing everything we can to protect our borders and to protect you, the population, here in Trinidad and Tobago. Our position remains persons or 330 nationals who are outside shelter in place. We understand it is going to be in inconvenient, difficult, painful in instances. Our measures with respect to exemptions are continuing in the strictest of ways. On a daily basis, I receive a lot of requests for exemptions, and each is carefully considered and dealt with in a very strict protocol and procedure manner. We cannot reopen our borders. We each, we all have family members, every single one of us, I'm sure, who are outside. I heard the Minister of Health. We all know about the Prime Minister and his personal circumstances. None of us is immune, including myself. And we would all wish our family members to be back home in the safety and comfort of our homes, but understand international travel, in particular airlines, cruise ships, those are the nest beds, potentially, of reimportation of this virus, and that is what we're seeking to prevent. I am happy to say that the Prime Minister has taken a decision, and we've discussed it this morning. We started discussing it actually a couple of days ago with respect to our students in UWE, at the various UE campuses, the Prime Minister has instructed the Minister of Finance to work along with the Minister of Education for us by Monday, we're aiming for by Monday, to get care packages to either the various campuses in UE, Mona and Kayville, or to our embassies or high commissions or consulates or missions abroad for us to be able to provide some level of relief to our students who are outside. The truth is at this stage, as much as you think it is inconvenient, and we do have empathy, the best thing to do is to shelter in place, and that continues to be our position. I will continue to look at your request for exemptions, and no amount of lawyers lawyering up and, and sending it to me is going to change anything, because every single one is looked at in a, a certain process and procedure. So our students and the families of the students continue to support them, the families who can, but the government is going to take certain actions to try and get care relief packages to our students at these various, various campuses across the university, across the CARICOM region. Cruise ships. I want the population of Trinidad and Tobago to understand something. There are well over 250, understand that number, 250 nationals on cruise ships across the region, across, across this Western Hemisphere now who want to come back home. Understand how quickly that will feed into our environment. Right now, from what we've been told, each and every one of them is in their own room, being fed properly and having entertainment. We understand, because even people here who have stay-at-home measures, the difficulty you face, you begin to get literal cabin fever. But right now, Trinidad and Tobago is not prepared. We cannot take that surge of persons from cruise ships back into our environment whilst we're trying to protect the people here in our environment and in our population. 
understand that is not an easy decision to take. It is one that personally weighs on me very heavily. And in particular, when I discuss these provisions with my cabinet colleagues and the prime minister. But it is a necessary measure that we must continue to take at this stage. We will not also allow other countries who continue to have their borders open and continue to allow international flights in be used as a jumping point into Trinidad and Tobago. Understand even some of our CARICOM neighbor countries who continue to allow travel to their country, we are not going to permit those countries to be used as an entrance point to the borders of Trinidad and Tobago, as is trying their people trying to do right now. Yesterday, on the instructions of the Prime Minister, a letter was sent by the Minister of Foreign Affairs to make just this point to one of our CARICOM neighbors. And I'm just going to read some excerpts of it because you need to understand we cannot allow other countries who have less restrictive border controls be used to infiltrate our border. It can't be an entry point. If you go to Barbados, you can then believe from Barbados, you can just jump on a plane, come across to Trinidad, or put that pressure on us because it will defeat all that we've been doing to protect us here. So yesterday, the Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs of Trinidad and Tobago, Senator the Honorable Dennis Moses, dispatched a letter to one of our CARICOM neighbors. He took the opportunity to present compliments and to wish that country all of the very best in their dealings with the global pandemic that is COVID-19 and the ill effects. He went on to advise that in Trinidad and Tobago, we began our measures to restrict the spread of COVID-19 on January 30th, 2020, when our cabinet imposed travel restrictions on anyone who had traveled from the People's Republic of China within 14 days prior. We continue to implement measures very carefully designed on the basis of advice received from our medical experts to limit and restrict the spread of COVID-19 virus from time to time. On March the 16th, 2020, it was announced that Trinidad and Tobago would be closing its borders from midnight on March the 17th to all non-nationals and on Saturday, the 21st of March, 2020, the government announced that Trinidad and Tobago would be closing its borders to nationals and non-nationals alike from midnight on the 22nd of March, 2020. This decision was not one made lightly or easily and was again based on clear medical expert advice that it was a measure that would protect the population in Trinidad and Tobago from the continued importation of COVID-19 virus. The clear evidence is that the spread of the virus was promoted by international travel, including travel on airplanes and cruise liners. Please be advised that our borders currently remain closed to both our nationals and non-nationals, and this measure should not be compromised. With the greatest of respect, we cannot have our decision to keep our borders closed, compromised by nationals or non-nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, using this particular CARICOM country as a jumping point. We respect your decision to continue to keep your borders open, but as explained above, ours are closed. In the circumstances, we request that you kindly respect our position and not permit your good offices to be used by those who may wish to compromise our current border measures. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not in usual times, we are in very difficult times, but the government will continue to keep our borders close. We continue to ask persons to shelter in place we will continue to apply our exemptions in the strictest measures, with the emphasis being on protecting the population here from a re-importation for the spread of COVID-19. There was a story I'd just like to caution as well. It disturbed me a few nights ago to see a story on TV6 of a person in Venezuela who claimed that he went down to Margarita, I believe, to look for treatment, cancer treatment, for a family member of his, and that that family member unfortunately passed away. A number of things jumped out at me when I watched that story. One, I knew nothing about it. But two, I then began to wonder, but you're going down there at a time when the border's are already being shut. We've said only go for emergency um, or absolutely necessary travel, and you've gone without the patient that you'd like to get the treatment. Nevertheless, I listen to the story because everyone is free to tell their own story. Less than an hour after the story aired, persons began to reach out to me personally. By the next morning, family members had reached out to me and spoken to me personally. Minister Cox was one of the first people to draw what family members were saying about that story. It was false. It was completely fake and false. 
By the following morning, before eight o'clock, family members had gotten hold of me and spoken to me personally to distance themselves from this person who was on television, TV6 News, claiming that the government was the worst thing and preventing him from coming home and he went there to get treatment for his family. They said that was not true. And they took great umbrage to it. They said that his credit card in those circumstances continued to be um, topped up in Trinidad, etc. But they wanted us, the government, to know that they supported our measures, that their family member had passed away. And our sympathy and our condolences went out to them, but that there was no truth to the reason this individual had gone there and he had no authorization from the family. These are the things we face. It doesn't deter us in government from continuing to do what we need to do to protect the population. I'll tell you, personally, it's not easy being bombarded constantly by these, these stories and persons with their agendas. But the Prime Minister leading his cabinet, we will continue to hold fast and listen to our medical experts. Venues, Minister Dialsing touched on it. The Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force has been working hand in hand with the Ministry of Health and I'd like to take this opportunity to applaud them for the great work. A week ago when we began looking at our outlook and planning, we identified a number of venues. I personally got involved knowing that Minister Dialsing is dealing with the medical issues coming at him very quickly, uh, along with the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force to provide that support we had promised. We went to Takarigua, we went to the home of football. The home of football is a great success story. I'd like to take the opportunity. We turn that venue along with the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force and the Ministry of Health in less than 72 hours, getting it from where it was to where it absolutely needed to be. I'd like to thank all of the corporate sponsors that came. It was at a site visit, picking up the phone, understanding how quickly we needed it as a step-down facility. Because you see, every facility that is used by persons then needs to be sanitized. So the Balandra facility couldn't be used. It needed an airing out period and to be sanitized. I thank FIFA and the Normalization Committee and even the TT, Trinidad and Tobago Football Association, for coming forward. I got that call, if I remember correctly, on a Wednesday or Tuesday afternoon to offer it as a venue, got hold of the Honorable Prime Minister. He gave the go-ahead for us to go and scoop it and to check it. By the next morning, we were there with the Defense Force. Corporate sponsorship came from Ansa Macal. Beacon provided the public liability insurance. I had a number of companies um, providing us with the fire extinguishers, Safe Tech, and some other companies. We then, and also the Fire Science Corporate, Trinidad and Tobago came speedily forward to help us get it ready. We had Flow provide the cable and the internet for each room. We had WASA on site within a matter of hours mm -hmm. doing all that needed to be done to get the water supply working. The Defense Force worked overnight to fix the sewerage system. CPEP, Minister Kazim Hussein and the CPEP gangs got there in a matter of hours after request, cleared the place, built fire trails. I am going to miss certain names. Uh, Mr. Robert Haddad personally donated light bulbs and other things to assist. Everybody just came together. It's a great success story. And that is one of the instances of what our Defense Force is doing on a daily basis. It is ready. It was up and ready within 74, 74 hours, 72 hours. I did a number of site visits along with Minister Dialsing's Ministry of Health personnel. And it was amazing how we got washing machines, dryers, electricals, everything up and running in 72 hours. That team has now moved to the Debe campus that I visited yesterday morning with them. I'd like to thank the University of the West Indies, Professor Marlene Atz, Professor Copeland, and the many others in their team. We will have the Debe campus. There are four dormitories of 24 units each in these four buildings. It will be up and ready by Friday. I was there yesterday with the Defense Force, Minister Dial Singh's Ministry of Health personnel and the UE personnel. We did a tour. And in touring the Debe campus, we discovered that there are other facilities there. God forbid we need to use them. We can quickly turn around. The same way Takarigua has mm -hmm. been turned around. The 33 nationals that came in were taken to Takarigua, yes. And that is how it goes. Every time there's going to be an influx of use of these facilities, you then need to think about others because God forbid we have a surge and that we need to deal with it. I may have missed out names. I'm certain I've missed out names. But thank you for all of corporate Trinidad who came together to help and assist us in getting these facilities up and ready. Yesterday at Debe Campus, the last thing we need is drapes and blinds for 92 rooms 
just to get them going. One of the buildings we'll use for the health personnel there, the other three will be utilized by persons that we will put if and when the time becomes ready. So we're right now at the DB campus getting it finally ready. I'd like to also take the opportunity to thank the regional cooperation there yesterday because the DB campus could not get final get approvals. One phone call, two phone calls, working along with Wasa Fire Services, all of these areas. And this morning, I was sent a copy of the approval that was given. Thank you for everyone coming together and doing what we need to do to get Trinidad and Tobago ready for our COVID response. Thank you to Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. It would be remiss of me not to point out this is what they do. They're securing every single one of these facilities. They're the ones moving persons from decanting and to facilities. They're the ones doing the engineering work and assisting Ministry of Health in some of the most mundane of jobs, but getting it done. Thank you for those who said that all you were doing is shining boots and medals. Once again, in your own silent but efficient way, you've proved to Trinidad and Tobago how well you work, and I thank you. Citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, insofar as our airports are open, other airports are open in the region, it, region, it can't become the potential to get into our border control and to infiltrate our border control. With respect to the 33 nationals who arrived yesterday from Barbados, I want to put on public record, they were in a very, very different category. Even before they arrived in Barbados, I personally had spoken to the Prime Minister of Barbados and her Attorney General on the 23rd of March. And part of the agreement with the government of Barbados on the 23rd of March was once they had completed their quarantining process and there was a process of testing or medical examinations, at that time it was testing, understand how fluid this is. Any one of you pinpoint yourself back to the 23rd of March to today, how different things have changed and measures have been implemented. On the 23rd of March, the agreement with the government of Barbados was once that quarantine period had ended in Barbados, we'd see about getting them home. That is a very different category to all of the other exemptions that are being looked on a strict case-by-case -case basis and from consideration, bearing in mind all I've spent some time this morning explaining about why we must continue to protect our borders. One completely unrelated point Seedlings, we are pressing ahead with agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm happy to hear the Honorable Prime Minister told me as I was coming in here. With respect to seedlings and those who produce seedlings, you are covered under the regulations. There are specific regulations here that cover you, where agricultural inputs, etc. But the point is you are covered by the current regulations. Please continue to proceed um, producing your seedlings that are needed for agriculture at this time. I end by saying this. I thank all of those who are helping us in these difficult times. Shelter in place to those who are outside. Understand that we, the government, are trying and we're doing all that we possibly can to prevent the spread of this virus. It is spread by contact. Allowing people back in increases this risk. The importation of the virus can be the wave that determines the fate of Trinidad and Tobago. Stay home, stay safe, and I'm committed the government of Trinidad and Tobago is committed to doing all that we can to continue to protect you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister Cox, Minister Dial Singh, Thank you. population of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister Young, for that comprehensive update. Members of the media, the floor is now open. Remember to identify yourself and the media house you represent before posing your question. You know we want to give you as, as many of you as possible an opportunity to pose questions to us. But that means in our limited time, we will have to give each media house a chance to get a maximum of two questions in. And once we have completed the pool and time allows, I will come back to you. So let us keep this in mind as we begin taking your questions. Guardian Media Limited. <coughs> Hi, good morning. Chester Sambrano, Garden Media. Um, good morning. Minister Young. Morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Minister Young, can you say how many requests you have gotten since the closure of the borders to citizens? And do you expect more legal challenges after the 33 people from Barbados who were allowed in? And can I get a quick question to Mr. Dial Singh? Can I get an update on the miking? How many areas have this been done in? And mm, okay. if, sure. have you noticed a reduction in people with symptoms um, presenting themselves to be tested. Okay, thank you very much. With respect to the first question, how many requests for exemptions? 
I can't provide the exact number, but there's been scores of requests that are being dealt with. Um, and it depends on if you break it down my, case by case, because case. for example, the cruise ship, oh, that, that's hundreds. So it's more than scores. And then second, your second question, I am not one, you should know by now, that delves into the rem realm of speculation. If persons decide to, to present their legal challenges, it will be dealt with. We have been following a lot of Commonwealth precedent as to how this is dealt with. I have been very careful and very specific today to explain that all of our provisions, especially with respect to border control, are based on medical expert advice and, and consideration and are done to protect the population of Trinidad and Tobago. And that's something we take very seriously. Okay, um, so if I could answer the second part of the question to Mr. Sombrano. So the MICAN is done under two entities, the Ministry of Health and also the Ministry of um, Rural Development, Local Government. The areas covered within County Carony under the Ministry of Health, Esmeralda Road, Ragunanan Road, Welcome Road, including all roads, traces, and tracks. County St. Andrew St. David, Picton Road Extension, El Reposo Road, Vega de Oropuch, Tate Trace, Green Street Street, Grand, sorry, Foster Road, El Carmen Street, Toco Main Road, Valafana Extension, Railway Extension Road, Ojo Road, Sahadine Trace, Wallenville, Little Coro Road, uh, San Louis Road. Under, would you like me to go on? Or under St. Patrick, Clarence Bissoon Street, Almond Drive, Penny Lane, Maiku Park, Samlal Trace, St. John Trace, Namdeu Trace, Akbar Trace, Sulal Street, and the Branch Trace, Sitaram Trace, Faizabad Zone, Bamboo Trace, Balgobin Avenue, Ramatali Park, uh, Kuldip Drive, Richardson Trace, Jesse Lane, Thompson Trace, Avocat Premier, Akbar Trace, Dukaran Street, Street, Hillview Gardens, under St. George East, Jamurat Street, Budo Soman Street, Palm Drive, Rafik Street, Mangru Street, Singh Street, Northern Avenue, Ram Rope Drive, Ramfall Street. Minister, just give them the um, okay. Give them the figure. Victoria oh. East. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have figures. I have all the streets, and that also includes Tobago. It's a comprehensive list. We could probably do a press release and give you all that information. And this is only Ministry of Health. Thank you. And I understand the Ministry of Local Government is also doing yes. some um, miking as well. We move to astronaut news. Astronaut news. Gwyneth Stewart, astronaut, Stewart, astronaut health newspaper. Good morning, morning Gwyneth. everyone. Okay, so morning. question to the Minister of Health and the Minister of National Security. Uh, Minister Dial Singh, what special significance do you attach to the fact that there was, after a lull period, there was one more case tested positive. And um, to, the min to Minister Young, uh, we, have, we have noticed a uh, uh, decrease, so uh, there seems to be uh, an appreciable decrease in serious national crime rate. Um, are there any plans for long-term implementation of some of the social constraint measures that would have probably helped with would, would it be do you see it as being practical okay so let me take you sorry let me just um go to the second part of chester's question he wanted to know about the decrease in symptoms the chief medical officer has already said on, on our earlier press conference that he has not noticed any rise in cases of um acute uh severe respiratory disease um your question about the one case that case to know what it emanated from we will have to come in with the investigations now with contact tracing and so on. Okay? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Oh, the, the answer is yes, we are having a decrease in serious crimes for Trinidad and Tobago. This is also an opportunity and a time, well, not an opportunity. We have also been implementing a number of operations to deal with it during this period, there being a lot less traffic. I can't get into the specifics of those operations, but I can assure you that we are doing a lot of work 
to keep that crime rate down. With respect to your question as to the continuation of these measures, these measures that we have in place are very specific measures to deal with COVID-19 and not being driven by the aspect of dropping crime and criminality. We will continue what, doing what we are and doing what we have to with national security to try and make Trinidad and Tobago a safer, more secure place. Thank you. Minister, are you okay? Yep. Yes. Yes. Thanks. 98.1. Morning, Ministers. Uh, Stephen Cummings from 19. Morning, Mr. Cummings. Morning. Good morning. Uh, a question for the Minister of National Security and um, the... Mr. Cummings, Minister can you just raise your volume? Yes. Um, how is it? Is it much better now? Yes. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm here clearly. Um, just uh, two questions quickly. Um, in the past, we have had uh, many unauthorized postings. Um, it is said that the spreading of uh, fake news is just as dangerous as the COVID-19 virus itself. Now, does the government have any prosecutorial or legal recourse against persons who would have been found uh, to be engineers of, of such acts? That's one. And the second, um, Minister Dayan Singh, knowing the busy schedule of our medical experts currently working in the field against uh, COVID-19, is it possible to have the return of more of the medical experts to help us understand uh, further the impact of this virus on the human body? Sure. Okay, just to answer the first question, the answer is yes, there are currently provisions in our law that allow us to allow the criminal side of justice to deal with it. That is the police service and the director of public prosecutions. This is with the fake news. But by and large, I think the population, certainly the sensible ones, have reacted as they should to this barrage of fake news coming from certain quarters. But if there is... A man, if we manage to trace who it comes from and who incites it, yes, there is law that can be used to deal with that. Okay, on the second part of the question, yes, so medical experts have been part of the panel up to yesterday. We did have Dr. Joanne Paul. Previously, we had two gynecologists. We had mental health. Uh, we also had one other. And on Friday, God willing, uh, we are bringing someone to deal with the non-communicable diseases component because most people who die of COVID are the elderly with non-communicable diseases. So that is on for Friday, hopefully. Thank you. Prior, ACP News. Um, you hear me? Um, hi, good morning, Prior Bihari, acpnews.com. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to say on the trend on the big one, national in Suriname say that they are out of food and out of money and they, they are in desperate need of your assistance. They say that they are willing to take the, the test, but the Suriname government do not have the kits that they want um, um, Trinidad to send the kits to them. Um, can you just see if you can speed up the process and, and give me an update on what is taking place with them in Suriname? The persons in Suriname, we are in constant collaboration with the individual with the government of Suriname we are do doing what needs to be done yesterday I was in communication with the a lawyer who represents 33 of them we will revert once we've heard back from the government of Suriname some of these instances now it is not for me I don't know who you're talking to and what they're telling you I certainly hope that no one is out of food but when I did investigate some of the instances and actually spoke to the employers of a lot of these people in Suriname. The employers here in Trinidad are making sure that they're well stocked with money, they're in safe and um, safe environments in their hotels, etc. And this will be raised with the government of Suriname as well. Power 102. Hi guys, good morning. Uh, head table. Morning. Good morning. morning. Um, I have two questions, one for Minister of Health and also one for National Security. Minister of Health, I saw the new um, release that you sent out this morning. Thank you so much for disaggregating the figures a bit for us. I just wanted some clarification in terms of what exactly are unique cases, because I know you sent out um, the release with unique cases. Also, from the total figure of 1425. You may need to repeat that question. It wasn't clear. Um, oh. We need some volume. Hello, Hello? Are you guys hearing me now? Uh, slightly better. All right, let me see if I can talk louder. Are you guys hearing me now? Yes. yes. Uh, Minister of Health, my question was for you. I was thanking you for the information that you included in the press release that you sent out this morning. I just wanted some clarification in terms of what exactly are unique cases. Okay. And if that 1425 represents new cases as well, 
I also want to keep on monitor. Are we testing um, for probable deaths? So, for example, somebody may have been admitted maybe for a respiratory illness. Are we doing a back check to see if that person would have died from COVID? That's your question, Minister of Health. And Minister of National Security, I know you have spoken at length about our borders being closed and you're not being allowed to open it for citizens. But we had the Barbadia, well, the Trinidad Nationals who returned from Barbados yesterday. And I know some people are asking, uh, is there a certain criteria that they can abide by to be allowed to enter the country? Is it that they can do this, 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 and then maybe government will consider allowing them to return home? Thanks. Okay, so let me take the first part of the question. Um, I did indicate that the total number of tests submitted was 1,425. The total number of what we call unique patient tests, that means individuals, is 1,195. So I hope that answers um, your first question. The number of persons tested is 1,195. Right. On the second part of your question, I will have to have the chief medical officer give me some data or information on the second part of your question. I wouldn't like to venture there. Minister Young. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity to repeat myself. I spent a lot of time here this morning saying that the government's position continues to be please shelter in place. I described that with the 33 people, the distinguishing factor with respect to them was that on the 23rd of March, which was a long time ago now, we, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, had an agreement with the government of Barbados how to deal with that. I use the opportunity to remind people Suriname's borders are closed as well. Venezuela's borders are closed as well. A lot of these countries, the borders are closed. We will look at each case on a very strict case-by-case -case basis. There is no single measure that anyone can take that would lead to an exemption. Thank you. TV6. Good morning, everyone. Urvashi from TV6. Morning. Um, morning. So just to get two questions into the Minister of Health, there's research which shows that COVID-19 patients, in addition to the need for ventilators, they also need dialysis. I'm asking, what is our dialysis capacity? And have you noticed, you spoke about the a ARDs, have you noticed this trend of people coming in with renal failure? Um, my second question is in relation to testing. You have indicated that you will be ramping up testing even further next week. Um, just to draw reference to three uh, countries, the Cayman Islands, for instance, their population is 60,000, and they've purchased 200,000 tests. Barbados, their population is 286,000, and they purchased 35,000 from Cayman Islands. Um, and I could go on and on. But the question is, with our 4,000 donated, and the 10,000 that we purchased, do you believe that this is sufficient to carry out the ramped up mm -hmm. testing as you envision, particularly because it, it, we, our capacity is to test one in every hundred, as it says. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So on the issue of dialysis, I did indicate yesterday that the Arima Hospital, the dialysis machines there will be dedicated solely in the unlikely event that we have a dialysis patient with COVID, um, with COVID, sorry. So they'll be accommodated at Arima. Have we noticed anybody with renal failure? I will have to check, to the best of my knowledge, not at this time. On the issue of testing, there's a very good article in the BBC that alerts people, do not compare country statistics with each other. You are comparing apples with oranges. Each country is different. And I would recommend that article. Um, you can't compare one country with another because everything is different in another country. Without calling names, if you look at Barbados and Trinidad, they have many more um, positive known cases. We are ramping up our testing and have started at the community level. So for instance, 63 cases, 63 tests have been done all negative. So we have started to ramp up our testings outside of known cases, primary contacts, secondary con contacts. Now we have gone to another layer, surveillance testing. When we get in the more kits and we are starting that from Monday, we then ramp up again. So it's a gradual process based on protocols and our own country's assessment of where we are. Okay, 
So I hope that answers your question. I-95.5. Wonderful Wednesday morning to all. Uh, with Field Turner from I-95.5, I have questions for both ministers. Minister Dial Singh, uh, private manufacturers of cloth masks are saying that they are running out of material to make those masks for distribution to members of the public. And they're asking for advice as to how they can go about sourcing additional material to continue making the masks for distribution to members of the public. And for uh, Minister Young, uh, Venezuelans are complaining that they're having issues with their expired cards. They're having trouble opening bank accounts, uh, obtaining police certificates of character, and some are even losing their jobs because of the expired cards. Um, what can be done to help them in the particular situations? Okay, so I'll take the first part of the question on cloth masks. To the best of my knowledge, FEEL, which is the NGO that is dedicated to distributing cloth masks, uh, they received their first tranche of cloth masks of 10,000 last week, and they are getting more on an ongoing basis. If it is the question is about opening up cloth stores to sell cloth, I don't think we are going down that way right now. But I am told that many private sector organizations are, in fact, in the process of making cloth masks, not only for their own staff, but to give to feel. Uh, so I hope that answers that question. Okay, thank you. With respect to the registration cards for Venezuelans, this simply doesn't arise. I'd said earlier this year we had granted extensions to those who had the cards in hand. That exercise is undergone. The year is not up from when we started distributing these cards, which would have been in July of last year. So that certainly um, doesn't seem to arise from a logistics point of view. I suspect people may have lost their jobs for other reasons with the closure of certain establishments. Thank you. TTT. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, morning. Two questions. One, well, Ian Wilson from TTT. Two questions. One, I know the government is against a state of emergency. You have stated that many times the Prime Minister said so too. But in recent times, you've seen the steel motor has been ignored by some. Some people are going to sell dogs. Some people are going <laughs> to visit boyfriends, COVID parties, and things like that. Is there a point where the government will just decide, okay, people are too hardened, we'll call an SOE? And second question, one funeral home has reported that they have information that other funeral homes are conducting services at homes of persons with more than the prescribed minimum persons. I just want to be clear on the guidelines regarding such gatherings, even if you have to repeat yourself. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Wason. Yes, we, we do get put into that position of having to repeat ourselves, but it's necessary in times like this. Let me deal with your second question first, because I was having a conversation along similar lines with the Prime Minister this morning. The regulations remain in place. Funeral homes, persons who are going through the, the painful process of a funeral, you ask to only have five persons physically present. You would recall that the Prime Minister who unfortunately during this period buried his favorite brother as he described him he abided by the five five persons at the funeral that is the law that is the regulation funeral homes please abide by it persons who are unfortunately going through the painful exercise of having to bury your loved ones please the law is five that law is designed to protect us here to protect you to protect your families please abide by it with respect to the first question of a state of emergency this government certainly will not just wake up one morning and say, look, we've had enough and people aren't listening and implement a state of emergency. Everything we're doing is on very, very carefully considered basis after a lot of this con um, conversation. And I can tell you, there's nowhere in part of our conversation at this stage, any conversation whatsoever with a state of emergency. Persons are, the vast majority are listening to the advice to stay at home. There are a few people who still aren't. And, and that, that's how it goes. And we continue to deal with it. The police will do what they have to do. The government will do what they have to do. But there's no conversation with respect to a state of emergency. That's another part of the question. Which, sorry, what was the other part? TTT, that was it? That was it. 
Thanks. Okay, good. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I saw your expression as though, you know, there's something else. Express? Morning. morning. Hi, morning, morning. Kim. Thanks. Uh, two questions, one for the Minister of Health, mm -hmm. one for the Minister of National Security. They may be a little bit repetitive. That's all right. um, Minister of National Security, just to return quickly to the issues of nationals abroad and care packages. You did mention care packages for, for some. So I just want to ask about the people in Venezuela who you continue to say that aside from the fact they want to come home, that they're also running out of resources. So if you could just specifically mention whether or not you'll consider care packages for them as well. Minister Dale Singh, yes. again, uh, back, to, back to the one new case and then also there were, I believe it's now a total of, let's say, uh, seven cases where, including the new one, epidemiological uh, mm -hmm. investigations would be pending. So just to go back for clarity, because we hear about community spread, but we've not yet heard any confirmation of, of community spread. We understand that, uh, you know, the contact tracing and the investigations take time. But can you, can you just clarify whether or not we may have witnessed community spread after all okay. this time? Okay, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, Kim Bodram. Sorry, I can't remember if I introduced myself. That's all right. Thank you very thank much. You. With respect to care packages, the care packages at this time are for our students who are at the University of the West Indies. That's the immediate that we're looking at. Again, with respect to Venezuela, you all get certain information. We get certain information. For example, persons who had raised issues in Venezuela and in Margarita in particular, we were told that the, the hotels have agreed to 10 US dollar a night and it'll be at the end. We're asking families in the first instance to help. This is something that we may look at down the road, but right now our main focus is on the students and persons are continu we continue to say, please just shelter in place, do the best you can. We understand it's inconvenient and painful. Okay, so let me take the second part of the question, Kim, and thank you for it. Um, so as the Chief Medical Officer has indicated, we are classified um, in the WHO category as sporadic spread. Um, whether we are witnessing community spread, that will only be determined by the science and the information coming out of contact tracing. It is too early to say where we are with that. As soon as we have that data, that will determine whether we have community spread or not. However, to prevent community spread, the message again simply has to be stay home. And that is how we will prevent um, a lot of community spread. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are out of time, but there was a hand still up. So we want to just ask you to, you know, pose your question to the point so that we can uh, finish at a reasonable time. Newsday. Hi, good day, everyone. Shane Spogel from the Newsday newspaper here. Uh, first question for Minister Yal Singh. Uh, do you by chance know how many private medical labs have been CAFA certified thus far? And there are specific time frame to get the certified. And second question to Minister Young with respect. Well, I know you would have touched on it earlier, but do you have any specific response to social activists, Ravi um, Balgobin, I believe? posing a legal challenge to the state on the constitutional, on whether or not it's constitutional to have the stay-at-home orders in place? Okay, so I'll take the first part of the question. The, I am not aware at this point in time that any private lab has been validated. We did say as soon as that process is completed, we will make a public announcement. As to the time frame, there is no fixed time frame to say it could be done in a day or a week. It depends on the capability of the lab to fulfill the requirements. Different labs will be in different states of preparedness. So there's no fixed time frame. I hope that answers your question. Thank, thank you very much for the question posed to me. I smile because three days ago in my daily briefing with the heads of security, I said, let's see who's the first attention seeker to jump out of the box. Um, the Attorney General has already responded to that pre-action letter. I'm certain his response is well-grounded in law. Personally, I see no chance of success on the constitutional argument for the reasons that I've, I've laid out. These roadblocks are not being conducted on the basis of stay-at-home orders. The police have powers of persuasion. They can tell all of us, stop drinking, for example, if they think we've consumed enough. We could continue to drink after that. 
and then there are other legal implications therein. So I am not going to put on any lawyer's hat. At the end of the day, everyone is free to approach the courts as they would, would like. But I know the Honorable Attorney General has already responded on behalf of the state. CNC3. Everyone, Carissa Lee here from CNC3. Hi, morning. 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 Um, I have two questions, one for Minister Young, one for Minister Dial Singh. Minister Young, I know you said that you would not be persuaded by any nation or any country to reopen the borders. This government will not be persuaded by any other nation reopening the borders. I just wanted to know, are there any considerations as to when our borders will be reopened? And for Mr. Dialsing, Minister Dialsing, I know you said we should not compare countries' statistics, but you also say, said we should be looking at how the virus is developing internationally. Yes. Internationally, I've read that, you know, 80% um, of severe cases, uh, they don't survive. Out of the, what I would like to know, out of the 37 people who were released and recovered from COVID-19, were all those patients, had, did all those patients have mild symptoms or did we have anyone with severe cases or severe uh, that recovered? Okay. Okay, I will answer the, the first one. Let me just clarify, huh, because I didn't say that we will not consider. What I said is that we will not allow other countries. We'll, we have no disrespect to any other country or their government in particular. What I was very careful to say is we will not allow other countries who have not closed their borders to be used as jumping off points and points of entry to Trinidad and Tobago. So it's not that we're not going to consider what our government may ask us, but we're not going to allow anyone to be used as a jumping off point into Trinidad and Tobago. And what was the second part of the, the question posed to me on that? Sorry. Is there any considerations as to when the borders, okay. our borders, will be well, open? Yes, I mean, this thing is very fluid. You've been hearing us use that term since March 12th. It continues to be that way. We at the cabinet level will continue to assess the situation. But you can see what's going on internationally. And I've spent a lot of time here this morning trying to explain the medical expert advice behind closure of borders. So certainly we continue to think about it, we continue to look at it, but it is not going to happen on the you know, 30th of April unless we are so guided by our medical experts. But I'm putting the, the population on warning and on notice. Our border control management, this measure of closing our borders, is one that protects us from the re-importation or the importation of the COVID-19 virus when it is still rampant outside there globally. Okay, so let me take the second part of your question, um, dealing with whether these people were mild or severe. If you go back to what we report every morning, all the patients right now, we have no one in ICU, no one in HDU. Um, most of, if not all of the patients are what you call ambulatory, that is they can walk around. And when you look at how we step them down into facilities, all the discharges come from there. The figure that you have to pay attention to, unfortunately, is those who have died. Those are the ones who normally present late. They are the elderly. And as Dr. Parkinson said, they are the ones who need a lot of support. And those are the ones who will um, unfortunately die. But all the persons who have been discharged will, of course, have graduated from whatever symptoms they are pre uh, presented with, right down to mild, asymptomatic, discharge, they get their two negative tests within 24 hours. Thank you, ministers. We have come to the end of today's virtual media conference. Do remember that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Communications are your only credible sources of government information on COVID-19. Before we go, we wanted to let you know that we understand that it feels like an eternity since COVID-19 changed the way we operated and lived our lives in Trinidad and Tobago. Our norm is to lime and be with family and friends. But you cannot revert to old habits because you are uncomfortable. You must not lose faith and take risks that will jeopardize your health and that of others. So I am appealing to you once again to follow the public health guidelines and stay at home. I am Donna Cox, Minister of Communications. Thank you for joining us today as the government continues its efforts to flatten the curve and beat COVID-19. Stay home. Stay safe. May God bless Trinidad and Tobago.